It also may require the, the short time frame may cause you to uh, seek additional help, external help. Whereas if you had a longer period of time, uh, you might have been able to do this totally inside, but now you may need to look at for uh, look to it additional external help so that you can meet the compliance state and, and avoid any misbranding. What we will do is walk through various steps for you to implement a UDI and a good ID system. First one there is to get a plan together, do the preparation, and then move into a, a preparation for the good ID submission actually pull the data together for the good ID and submit that data and then we'll talk about uh, rolling into a, a maintenance ongoing uh, a steady state process where you'll be uh, submitting uh, uh, any changes and rolling products out the door with the uh, new label design. So as we walk through these steps uh, I've identified some sub topics that need to be covered in each step and this particular one, the first one, UDI prep, has four different sub areas and we'll walk through those in the next few slides. It's very critical that you include multiple departments and, and multiple team members. So it, it's very common that the regulatory would take lead in this team, but you'll find that UDI permeates into many different areas of a, of a company uh, product design, manufacturing operations, you know, around the circle there, regulatory quality, even sales and marketing and so on. And especially with the complex, com collapsed time frame, you want to make sure that you do have representations from each of these departments so that you are not faced with a, oh, by the way, uh, a few weeks to go before the deadline and then realize that there, there's a major hiccup. So include various representatives from these uh, areas inside your company and it will uh, help uh, spread the workload around as well. Part of your investigation for that team will be to learn the basics, find out what is required for your particular product. You want to identify your classes and your product codes and so on. I highlighted a couple links here that you might want to go to. These are uh, good introductory links and at the bottom because of the time frame, I strongly recommend that you, as you start to feel overwhelmed, that you quickly refer to industry associations. There's a number of um, online uh, information and education available. Uh, you may want to consider consultants in, in connecting with vendors. Um, those people that have done this for the last two years are a great resource for you to uh, pose questions to. And rather than figuring out all of this on your own, uh, which is going to extend your implementation time, I would uh, highly suggest you, you talk to someone that has walked through this already. So after you figure out the requirements for your inventory, next would be to evaluate where you are. So this is commonly referred to as a gap analysis. Look at where your data is residing. Are you currently identifying it in one of the FDA approved agency uh, like a GS1, a HIBIC, or a ICC BBA standard? Uh, if, if you are, that's great. If not, uh, you need to contact one of those three and set up an account and start understanding their, their protocol for numbering. Look at the various processes that you have in place and what systems that you you have in place. Are they going to be compliant and able to handle UDI? Uh, there are some external parties that do gap analysis to help you move along and there will be various comments like that as we work our way through the system today or through our presentation today where if you're overwhelmed, low on staff, uh, need to accelerate, uh, we'll try to uh, give places where you can kind of collapse this and, and spread the work. And then uh, this final step in uh, the preparation would be to uh, get that particular standard in place. So if you are currently not using GA1 or HIBIC, for example, 
Um, you'll need to map your identifiers over to that new standard and make those process changes so keep the, your quality management system um, up to date. And then secondly, as the final step in this preparation is to revise the actual label uh, itself. So you, some companies, I will mention here, have taken this event to say, let's go across the board, let's uh, update our labeling system, and then you know we're thinking of doing this anyway, now's the time. Well, four months out from your compliance date, I would suggest that maybe this is not the time to make a, such a drastic major system change. So one of your options here is to modify your current system in place and being able to uh, talk to someone that is ex experienced in getting UDI on, onto your labels. Um, it, it just um, complicates matters if you bring a brand new major system in, in at this point in time. Not to say that it cannot be done. Uh, you want to realize that you have a time barrier here and limited resources. And not only your labeling system, but all your other production supporting systems. So your ERP, your uh, master data management system, the uh, supply chain activities, are all of these able to support the new UDI? And just think about that new product identification on your product as it goes out the door. Who sees it? What systems do they have to read it? And think about able to have that identified all the way down to the end user. So the next major step is, that we'll talk about is looking at the good ID system and doing preparation for that particular system. So, hey, Gary. Sure. Um, since we scheduled this to be 90 minutes, um, I thought maybe I'd interrupt you here and ask some of the questions that have been asked already. Do you think that will work, or do you think we should wait till the end? So I, I think it would be good to do some interaction. Um, we'll just keep in mind the, you know, the total time so, okay. so that we do have time to cover all the, the, uh, the content. But let's go ahead and hit some questions. Orhada asks, what happens if after the compliance date the company realizes it has not published one or several products by mistake? What's going to happen to us? <laughs> well, the, the FDA technically calls this scenario a misbranding. So uh, some companies, if they are uh, extremely cautious, will stop production of that uh, product. Um, you obviously want to rectify that as soon as possible. We have not heard of any fines levied or any other uh, uh, imprisonments or you know civil activities that the FDA has levied against the company that has not cooperated. So I believe there's going to be some leniency in getting started. Um, I think it probably would be best to um, identify those products and you know, have some type of, of plan to uh, get that in place in the event the FDA does come on site and want to know what's happening and why these products are, are not uh, identified. Okay. So um, I, we haven't seen anything yet, Joe. Deborah asks, if a device has multiple components, such as a power cord adapter, a controller, and powered warming mattress that can be purchased separately or together, do each of the components need a separate UDI? So the FDA has addressed this particular scenario, and if all those individual components are sent out as a system, then the system needs to have a UDI and, and all the components fit into that category. But it sounded like from what you uh, read from that question is that some of these components are sold on their own and, and marketed on their own. In that case, then the FDA requires that those individual components have their own UDI separate from the system UDI. Okay, and uh, Vicki actually emailed me ahead of time um, with a similar question. She asked uh, if a kit contains three different devices and one out of the three is exempt from direct marking, should the kit be submitted 
with the direct, uh, pardon me, device subject to direct marking but exempt selected as yes? So I think the, what we have seen, uh, the FDA take the, the most cautious, the most extreme high-risk uh, component and report on that. So uh, yes, in, in this case, the, the overall kit should be identified with, with direct marking. Uh, another scenario where a kit might have, uh, let's say, one product that needs uh, sterilization. Uh, so the FDA, again, would use that rule of thumb and say, take the worst case component and report the system level kit at you know, the, the extreme level. Okay, the, uh, the questions are beginning to queue up, so perhaps we should go back to a regularly scheduled program. <laughs> okay, very good. Well, we were at a good break point, and uh, maybe we'll stop uh, along each step and, and take a look at those questions and, and field us some uh, in uh, the major steps. Okay. So th this step that we're about ready to talk about here, Joe, has to do with the uh, preparing the, the good ID submission system. The FDA has established two major uh, avenues to report data into this uh, global unique device identifier database, as affectionately called good ID. And the first one has to do with manual entry. So FDA has provided a website and uh, referred to as the good ID web interface, where you can go online and manually key in your data. Obviously, there, there's manual effort and transcription errors that you need to uh, review and do a quality check on. The other option is to submit the data electronically. And that particular format uh, has a, a particular protocol that is XML-based and used by the FDA for other uh, data product information and submissions uh, to the agency. So they, they have leveraged that particular standard that's actually put out by Health Level 7. Um, for this particular instance, and there is a means to capture that very same data, uh, put it into this particular document, and send it to the FDA electronically through the Electronic Submission Gateway. This next slide details those two major areas into some uh, more granular descriptions. The first one across the top is the Good ID web interface manual entry. The second one uses SPL as well as the, the, the third and fourth avenue. The second one has to do with making use of a hosted piece of software that a labeler could uh, transfer data to and have that piece of software manage and store that data electronically. Uh, Based on the system, there will be version control, um, various rights for editing and so on, and then submitting that data into the, the FDA in that XML format that we talked about. The third option available using it, or it also uses SPL, but in this particular model, you're able to submit your structured data, this data that that you have to collect in, uh, for all these scenarios and send that off to an outsourced service and say, I don't have the time, energy, effort at this point in time to take care of that. I would prefer that you handle that. So this is a, a pure outsourced service model where that data is handed over to a third party and they would be able to build the SPL and submit for you. The last one that would be viable, except for this time frame, in my opinion, uh, would be to build your own solution inside your four walls and put it inside uh, your environment. Or you may go out and purchase a piece of software, uh, have it installed, do the installation, do the IQ, OQ, PQ, validation on it, and so on, and do the training. Um, it's my opinion that this four-month window that we have is insufficient to, to think of that one at, at this point in time. So if you're well along that way, um, you know, yes, you still are able to uh, use that, obviously, 
But if you're embarking on a decision at this point in time, um, at least I would think that it, it's going to be extremely difficult. I would highly recommend that you pick a, a system that is already in place, ex, um, well oiled, <laughs> experienced, been working uh, for a number of years submitting uh, class three products and, and implants, life sustaining, life supporting, uh, and, and pick a solution that already has a proven track record rather than embarking on something brand new. <coughs> we won't go into this chart in detail, but you can go back as homework and take a look at some of these uh, characteristics for those various solutions. Uh, the, the four rows identify the FDA Good ID web interface, uh, the hosted version, the outsource, and, and the on-premises. Uh, on and again, the note there, uh, I don't believe at this point in time the, the on-premises installed software will have time to do that. Now, some of these ho hosted software systems are able to be um, tiered uh, as far as pricing and, and capability goes. So um, I'll just give an example from our, our particular solution <coughs> where we offer the hosted software and the outsourced. And some of our clients only have a single record. So it, it's able to be scaled appropriately to um, small to large volume submissions. Excuse me a second, I'm going to take a quick drink of water. Okay, so you can go back and take a look at those uh, in, in more detail. <clears throat> and Gary, while you, took slide, your, also, while you took your water ahead, break, I, I sent out the slides to everyone and uh, I'd caution that if each of you try to click on them at the same time, I might crash my system. So based it out a little bit, but uh, I know this is a common request and perhaps it'll answer some of the questions you'd otherwise ask. Thanks. Okay. Yep. Very good. The slide that we have uh, in front of us now goes through some of the characteristics that uh, you want to evaluate as you pick a solution. So I, I strongly recommend, due to, the, again, that time frame, the expertise and experience from uh, the provider that you choose. Uh, making sure that whatever system they have in place accommodates your your volume, um, are, are familiar with the various modes of, of submission. Uh, if you're using electronic submission, um, are they able to uh, um, have the account set up, you know, you know, being able to assist you in that? Are they able to do some testing for you? Um, there is an FDA requirement for SPL systems to be 21 part 11 compliant, so it's another good question for you to tick off. Uh, and then more importantly, ideally you would have connectivity to your internal systems to share data and make sure that data is synchronized between uh, some legacy data that you have and new UDI systems. We're not going to talk too much today about the international roadmap, but Keep in mind that being able to scale up and also go uh, across the, the world in various submissions is definitely a highly rated uh, capability that you want to uh, consider. And then, again, because of the time frame, uh, subject matter expertise, knowledge, um, how are you able to get information and, and is the timing quickly uh, available to you? So you can uh, fill that chart out across the board as you evaluate particular uh, systems. After you have a system targeted and start to uh, work on that, then the next major step would be to create your FDA accounts. So all labelers that are submitting data would need to create an FDA good ID account and you need to submit information about your company and, and your users and so on and the FDA would respond with credentials and you're able to go in and start working um, in, in a draft mode and then also submit data uh, electronically or uh, uh, submit it uh, through the website. The, those people that, those labelers that are using electronic submissions would also need to set up an FDA electronic submission gateway. So that just includes another step of uh, putting a test together for the pre-production submission and then creating a production account. Again, with the timeline very tight, 
Um, some vendors will, in, in you're going electronic or, or even the FDA account, some systems of some vendors will be able to support you and guide you along this process of setting up both your FDA good ID account and your electronic submission account. Uh, for example, we, we've done, well, I think uh, as of today, 140 or so of these particular setups, accounts set up. So we're well experienced and can help you uh, answer questions as you work your way through uh, setting up accounts. And in regard to the electronic submission gateway, that particular shared resource is available to all clients. So some of these things that are able to be done on your own with a tight time frame, you want to look to uh, solutions and vendors that are able to collapse the, the effort and the time for you to get up uh, and running with UDI compliance. Joe, we're at another break spot. Before we start talking about data, do you have a couple questions about systems? Um, as before, questions have gotten away from us. We have dozens and dozens, so let's continue and we'll we'll save them till the okay, end. Okay, very good. So I'm going to move into uh, the data set that needs to be submitted to the FDA. There is some common fields uh, off the top of my head. I believe it's 12 fields that are shared with the labeling system. So obviously the, the catalog number, the, the, the uh, description, um, the uh, device identifier, and, and a, other bits of information um, are able to be shared on both the label and the submitted uh, data set. But there's a whole host of, of other data, and you'll find this data scattered about the inter enterprise. Um, it could be in multiple file formats, could be in various locations, could even be in a spreadsheet of someone that has left the company. So <laughs> um, finding some of this is um, a little bit of a daunting task and good reason to start early and to start to ferret out some of these areas, these particular data fields that are, that are tough to come by or, or that you don't have readily available. The, um, the other um, consideration is to make sure that you have access to some of the agencies that the FDA has, has pointed to for product identification, um, the, the global uh, device, global medical device uh, nomenclature, the GMDN uh, is need to be uh, identified or using the FDA alternative. There's something new called the Dun & Bradstreet Dun's number for your company, which you may not have exposure to. What I'll mention here on this slide is, is we talked about these um, tasks of defining data. And you might find um, that some of the data does not actually appear in electronic form. So um, an example of such would be a single use icon on your label that you know appears and goes out with the product, but it's not electronically held as a digital value that you can uh, use a Boolean true or false and submit it to the FDA. So there's some other uh, considerations as you work your way through uh, collecting this data. The last item on this slide would, talks about collecting some additional data fields. Uh, you might want to do that just for uh, ownership, but um, I probably would not recommend collecting your international regulatory data at this point in time. Um, there's some time that you want to take in the future to do that, but now is probably not the, the best time. Uh, for your reference, this slide identifies the, those 55 fields and the uh, seven additional that the FDA derives from those fields for a grand total of 62 in the database. And uh, we here at Retech offer a data template, so whether you use ours or another one, uh, I would highly recommend starting to put this data together in a structured format. Many of these uh, templates and guides allow you to have um, the FDA regulation guidance available so it helps you identify what particular value and the format of that value needs to be recorded. Uh, I'm going to leave this for a homework slide 
where we have found over the two and a half years of doing this that a number of collection issues occur. Uh, this is put together from things that we have seen. It is also includes some items that the FDA has identified and, and shared with industry about their data the collection and getting the data in place such that it meets all the validation issues that the FDA has. We're going to move over to another step of this data processing where after you've collected the data, there's something called data normalization and validation. And what do I mean by that? To normalize the data it means to, to make sure that it, it fits the FDA's business rules. So uh, one thing to check, for example, is if you're using GS1, uh, G10 numbers uh, to make sure that you have 14 numerical characters, 14 uh, digits, and you have proper dates. Um, there's a list of values that need to be observed. For example, you might have centimeter spelled out in your database and used uh, various places, and yet the FDA um, only accommodates the CM for that particular um, submission. And there's other examples here, but the bottom line is uh, trying to make sure your data is pristine is absolutely valuable because you don't waste um, time making multiple submissions to the FDA and, and getting iterative feedback. If your uh, system that you have for Good ID System is able to do a pre-check against the FDA's business rules, you're you greatly collapse the, the iterations that you need to do, and some uh, advanced systems are able to help you along this data transformation, normalization, and validation. Um, here's some more examples. Again, I'm going to leave this for homework. And the next two slides go into very specific examples that we have seen that cause a particular record uh, not to be accepted by the FDA. So again, homework, homework. Now, uh, next thing we'll do then is to submit the data. So we have put together a submission process for the FDA Good ID, and we have collected the data, and now we're ready to submit. So we're working our way across left to right on this uh, workflow, where at this point in time we're ready to use the uh, submission particular method that we picked, whether it's uh, the FDA Good ID web interface or using the electronic SPO. Uh, here's some detailed steps and how that is actually done. There's a web interface uh, manual, user manual available, so you can work your way through through that and um, make data submissions through that. For the uh, SPL, which lends itself to an automated electronic, uh, more accurate type of submission, uh, there's some steps there that you would walk through to, to build that SPL file. And again, your solution should be doing that in the background and then sending that to the FDA, uh, which also accommodates bulk entry for multiple uh, records that need to be submitted. It is important as this slide uh, discusses, to verify that the data actually did make it to the FDA. So you want to make sure that um, records are showing up as, as published, and there's a grace period that we'll talk about. Um, FDA is allotting 30 days grace period where you can make some edits, except for the published date field. And after that period, then the uh, there's a number of data fields that become fixed. Verifying that acknowledgement, verifying that data to the FDA on SPL submissions is a little bit different. There's a XML file called an acknowledgement file that is returned from the FDA. So make sure that your system properly addresses those acknowledgements one, two, and three. There's three separate events that are um, acknowledged by the FDA. Again, I'm going to leave this for homework. Um, these are some lessons learned from submitting well over 140,000 records at this point in time. And you might want to uh, keep this in mind so that you don't 
fall into that trap and again delay your uh, publication. After the grace period has been completed, those records that you had submitted to the FDA are available on this website. This is a public website, Access Good ID. There's uh, four or five fields that are redacted out, but otherwise it's the data that you submitted and is made available publicly. So you can do some searches and, and find that data, confirm, um, and actually you can poke around and see what other companies in your particular sector have, uh, have submitted. Um, and, and that is one of the final confirmations that your data has been actually published. Now we're ready to move into production and, and maintenance. Um, so up to this point, we talked about changing the labeling system. We talked about the good ID system, the data, and the submission. All that is a criteria before you actually ship product out, your, out the door. So once the publish date occurs in the good ID submission, that's the legal time frame, that milestone that says you are now able to ship product that is properly marked with UDI on the label. And you want to obviously coordinate this event. Um, you can actually uh, ship product families early uh, or in an incremental, you know, phase them in once the submissions are made to the FDA. So there's no reason to wait till your full inventory has been identified at the get ID before you uh, cut over uh, all your products. So this can be a phase. One thing to keep in mind is, is the timeline uh, for that compliance date. And then, since this is a very um, young, dynamically uh, changing environment, the FDA changes specs periodically. Uh, there will be some date, data maintenance, and if you have some values that change, the FDA talks about keeping those records up to date. Uh, there's system maintenance, and there's knowledge maintenance. So as the FDA rolls out, uh, new regulations and guidance, uh, you'll need to uh, keep abreast of those and make changes accordingly. This slide details some of those timing events for label changes. Um, if the value is actually appearing on the label of the product, you'll need to report that to the FDA Good ID before you actually ship that change. If there's a value, let's say it's the, um, you, you added a, a uh, um, a supplement number to, to the product. Um, that does not appear on the label, so you have 10 days where you can start shipping products um, early, uh, but within those 10 days then you'll need to report that supplement change to the FDA Good ID. I'm not going to go into this slide, but again it's a homework slide. Uh, most important to uh, pick up off this slide is the bottom right panel that lists the various fields that become fixed. So once a, a particular record passes through this life cycle from unpublished to published in a grace period to then fully published, uh, those 11 fields would cause you to create a brand new device identifier in the new record. So the impact of that is, is significant. Where now your whole identification system needs to be updated for that particular product. So getting these fields correct is one of the prime activities to make sure uh, when you verify and validate your data as it will not be able to be changed and, and will cause um, a new record to be submitted. I would normally talk more about the global impact of UDI and activities that would taking place. But in this four-month time frame, you know, we're just going to have to put that on the shelf. There, there is not much consideration. Just to know that there is uh, strong and, and active um, efforts being made around the globe uh, in various uh, countries, uh, regulatory agencies are, are moving forward with UDI, and there will be uh, implementation timelines for, for those agencies as well. But uh, it's not in the next four months. so. Uh, we're going to put it on, back on the shelf. This slide summarizes those steps that we walked through, and I wanted to also show how they might relate in a timeline 
In this particular um, page, we show the UDI plan that needs to be put in place very early and then immediately launch uh, any UDI labeling system preparation. In parallel, you'll need to start the Good ID system preparation. And again, uh, highly uh, value those systems that are already in place and running. Make use of those rather than try to invent something from scratch. And then you, in, while you're finalizing that system, you can start collecting data. So that actually will take you a significant amount of time. We see a lot of uh, data prep issues. And then squeeze in that good ID submission near the end. Uh, I would target um, a couple weeks, if possible, before the, the compliance deadline so that as you have any delays or uh, problems with particular products, you have a little bit of leeway. And then as soon as that registration and reporting has been done at the FDA Good ID and your labeling system is ready, I would cut over to a, uh, the, your production system with UDI labels and start shipping products out the door. That can actually occur as soon as your um, submission has been made to the FDA and, and your labels are updated. You don't have to wait for the, uh, the 24th of September. In fact, you obviously want to back off a little bit of that so you have, again, a little bit of leeway. Uh, ideally, you would not interrupt the production flow. There are a couple challenges that I'll quickly highlight. We expect well over two times the number of submissions from last year. Um, and uh, last time I did a count earlier this week, I think there's still about 400,000 uh, submissions that are expected to be added. So I think it's going to get rather busy at the FDA competing with other companies that are asking for help uh, from their, the FDA help desk. Uh, there's certainly a lot more class two manufacturers than, than in the previous wave. So there's more companies. In many cases, they're smaller staffed. They don't have the, uh, the background knowledge. So there might be more questions as a result. And Help Desk, I think, is going to uh, see a significant overload. We also saw the actual data um, submissions being uh, acknowledged in, in much delayed fashion than in previous times. So what used to be returned in 12 minutes took three days uh, as you, we got into that final week, the last few days. So all that to say, start early, start now, and uh, submit as early as you're, you're able to. Joe, I'm going to switch gears a little bit. And just for those people in the audience that would like um, to evaluate a particular solution, uh, go into a, a quick description of what we offer, and then we're going to move over to Q&A. Let me quickly talk about the FDA Good ID solution. This is our core expertise, where we sit between the medical device manufacturer and the FDA and offer a outsource model as well as a software as a service model where data flows into that blue block and electronically flowing data in. We validate all that, that data to the FDA business rules, keep version control. We have rules available. And then um, I'll allow a, a process to, of approvals to take place, build the SPL, and then automatically submit that to the FDA. So some of those things that we talked about earlier, a vendor having a, a template for you to work off of, guidance, um, helping you through questions, helping you through account setup, um, sharing electronic submission gateway resource, no need to use your own, and uh, just working your way through this whole process. All those things are, are part of the offering that we supply. Since we do tier this particular solution to the volume of submissions, I think you'll find it's very cost effective. Uh, most importantly for this discussion today is that it saves time. So 
uh, within a week you can have a, a very quick startup and uh, use a well-oiled uh, proven and compliant system. It's uh, very um, uh, easy to work with. It's uh, not intrusive into your existing system and it's flexible with a couple different models of, of implementation. And it basically we help you uh, walk through this scenario and supply support. The last thing I'll mention is because of the uh, years that we've had working with submissions, uh, we have that expertise available for you. And again, I think I had mentioned about over 145,000 submitted records. So this is a, a well-oiled uh, and experienced uh, solution that you can make yourself a bit, uh, uh, or you can consider. And we compare the number of volumes or the volume of submissions that we've made to the total good ID. And it looks, looks roughly about 25% of all the submissions that the FDA has has flowed through our system. So it's a very um, significant uh, major provider of that data. We work with uh, well over 140 customers, um, again, very small to large, and be glad to talk more. We do make available a Retech um, UDI guide, and this is uh, able to uh, guide you along the way. This would be a, a free download, so you can follow up with that particular link. Joe, I think I'm at the end of this presentation as far as the prepared material. And what we would like to then to do is um, have you take a look at some of the questions and, mm -hmm. and put those forward and let's take the remaining time to help the audience through uh, the, the, the questions they have. I have to say I'm surprised I didn't realize you have done one in four submissions to FDA. Yeah. Yeah. It's, That's shocking. It's, yeah, 25 percent of, of all the records that are there. So, wow. Uh, I, I think what that means is a lot of small companies, um, uh, you know, you make make their one or two submissions, but the uh, we have some very large clients that submit high volumes. Yeah, it's just and, too much to manage on your own. Okay, well, I have a lot of questions here for you. So, Vincent asks, some of our devices are really tiny. They are two milliliter vials of reagents. The labels are one inch by one inch and don't have space for much of anything, especially not a barcode. How do other companies handle this issue? Yeah, so there is a, a question about, you know, the product being way too small for the, the, the label itself. Uh, some companies have been very creative in attaching a label. So if this is a single use product, uh, they might put it in a, a bag and then put the label in the bag or attach the the label with um, some type of a, a plastic f fastener. Um, if the product is needs to be direct marked, meaning it's used uh, after the original packaging is probably dropped by the wayside and discarded, then you have another issue and, and that um, uh, falls into the direct marking and I don't know if we want to go there right now, but I'll just quickly say there is an exception for the direct marking if the product is too small or if it would affect the, uh, the, um, the effectiveness or the safety of that product, uh, it would not need to be uh, on there. So uh, there's not a general exclusion that the FDA has for, for the product being too small, um, although what we have seen is some companies would write that up in their design history file and then you know, have that discussion available in the event the FDA questions them for that particular very, very small product. Gabriel asks, how does all this affect distributors who sell private label products? So, yeah, the, the FDA has now um, only addressed the, 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 the suppliers to the marketplace. So if you are a labeler or even a relabeler or repackager, um, you might be a contract manufacturer, all those categories the FDA considers uh, labelers, if you will. And they have responsibility to, to label their products. Now, once you get into the, 
the, the supply chain. Um, the FDA has not uh, enforced, you know, records of this as of yet. There is some um, uh, direction from the FDA that this is going to be coming so that you'll be able to track a particular um, device all the way through its logistics down to the eventual end user and patient. So, you know, might go to a hospital and, and then a uh, physician uses it on, you know, patient X. So that, I think, is, is coming. Um, right now, the uh, um, regulation only applies to identifying the product uh, as it's released into commercially available into, into the marketplace. Okay. And uh, Matt, I think this answers your question, too, uh, what he just said. If our company reprocesses other companies' medical devices, are we responsible for labeling, even though we're not the OEM? Yes. Uh, in that case, a, if you reprocess the product, you, you would need to uh, put your own label on that uh, reprocessed product. Sorry, Matt. More work for you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we, had a couple, we had a couple questions about dates. Um, is the day needed in the date, or can we just say year, month? When there is a date that appears on the, the, the label, and I'm going to try to back up to that slide, the day is required. So if you have an expiration date that is shown on the label itself, uh, you will need to include that uh, date. Now, many companies have not really tracked that in the past, so they are using the last day of the month as a default. There is a little bit of a discussion, and I don't know if Matt is trying to ask about expressing the date in a um, particular format inside UDI. Uh, David, um, it was David, and he actually said oh, YYYYMM. Yes, right. So David may be referring to the year, 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 dash, month, month that is inside the, the GS1 protocol for expressing the, the date. So it's an interesting um, little bit of a contradiction where if the date appears as a standalone item, what they call free text, out on the label, expiration of a certain date, then that needs to include the day. When you embed that ex expiration date in the UDI, in the barcode, and the value of the barcode, and you make use of, let's say, the GS1 protocol, the GS1 protocol does not include the day. So uh, why don't Matt or David and I get a hold of each other and, and discuss his particular scenario if, if he still has a question? Okay. But there is that, but appears to be a contradiction between what the FDA is telling uh, industry. Dan, if you would, go ahead and type Gary's email address and share it with the audience. Uh, Michelle asks, can you explain what the published date is in the Good ID database? Yeah, that, well, that's a really good question, and there's a lot of questions about published date. So this is a date that uh, does two, th uh, does a couple things. One, it's the date that uh, legally satisfies your responsibility for reporting uh, your device to the FDA. Secondly, it marks the transition from an unpublished record to a published record and starts what is referred to as a grace period of time. So if you walk through the life cycle of a, a data record, you could submit a data record today and have the published date uh, two weeks uh, in, in the future. So between now and those uh, that published date, those two weeks are referred to as the unpublished time. So the, you get feedback from the FDA, you know, that it was accepted and so on. But it's really held in limbo um, in this unpublished scenario. And you can make various changes. All fields are able to be changed in that unpublished scenario. But when the published date occurs, that marks the beginning of a grace period. Uh, the FDA is currently allotting 30 days for that grace period. And only uh, the holder of that record is able to see that data for that period of time. 
you can make changes to all the fields except the publish date, so you can't you know, play with the publish date. And then after that 30-day window, the product automatically uh, closes the grace period and then it's fully published and most importantly made available on the Access Good ID to the public. So there's a couple events going on there. Um, during that grade, the FDA fully expects the holder of that data to, to make sure that especially those 11 fields that are all of a sudden going to be fixed at the end of that 30 days to go in and, and verify those, those records, uh, those values. So hopefully that answers the question about the publish date. And Michelle also asks, is the AIDC another label uh, versus the current label placed on the product. Can you explain this? It's not the UDI label, it's another label. Oh, yeah, no, that's a, a good question. It's really, uh, it's not a new label. It's a form of presentation of the UDI data value itself. So if the data value was, uh, let's say it was, um, uh, the, uh, the DI was 14 characters and the production identifier happened to include a um, uh, 20 more digits for a, a serial number, for example. That data, that full UDI device in production data, would near, need to be uh, appearing in human readable form, meaning that you know it's printed out on, on the label as you know it today. And secondly, it also needs to be embedded into uh, what the FDA refers to as an AIDC format in that presentation. That presentation, the FDA does not require any particular technology, but most of the industry has either used a one-dimension or a two-dimension barcode. Uh, technically, you could use like an RFID type of a, a transmission for, for that. But the idea is that the FDA wants not only a human to be able to read that value, but also able to be handled uh, accurately and efficiently through uh, some electronic means. So being able to scan it with a barcode, for example. So it, it's uh, both of those items, both of those presentations need to appear on your current label. So Michelle's definitely getting her money's worth. There are another two or three questions in the queue here. Uh, we'll try to get to them. Um, just to manage everyone's expectations, it is the top of the hour. We are doing this for 90 minutes today. We are recording it. and. Uh, for those of you who are joining a medical uh, devices group webinar for the first time, uh, I will have this conversation transcribed for those of you who learn better by reading. Uh, we have a question from Dora, and she says, uh oh, just by the way, too, uh, the question queue goes all the way back 45 minutes now. So if I haven't read your question yet, that doesn't mean I don't have it. Um, stick around. Dora asks, what if my product is an MDDS device, medical device data systems? Do I need to do this UDI stuff as well? I paraphrase there. MDDS. Medical uh, device data system. Oh, oh right. So uh, there is, uh, it all comes down to whether or not your product is fulfilling the definition of a device and is regulated as a device. So some data systems, and I'm not sure if, if that's the scenario in this uh, particular case, uh, handle data uh, and, and store data uh, many times connected with a mobile device. Uh, let's say uh, for the discussion purposes, Fitbit generates a bunch of data about your heart rate and records that data and it's stored in a data system. Um, if that apparatus is regulated and controlled as a device, then it would need an identifier. Uh, I would think off the top, without any detail, that many of these data systems do not need UDI, as long as, again, as, the, as long as they're not considered a device. Celine asks, just to make sure, if my company only imports and resells products from Germany without altering the label, and the label is compliant to European regulations. Do we need to worry, at least for now? Yeah, unfortunately, you do need to worry. Ooh. So, 
all the product, so the, the scope of the product. You sure you're just be, not trying to drum up business for yourself, Gary? <laughs> yeah, it's a default. Yes, yes, yes. Right. <laughs> well, uh, uh, this is not Gary's answer. This is the FDA's answer. Everything that uh, all devices that are marketed in the U.S., commercially marketed in the U.S. across state lines, um, uh, unless there's some exception in in the final rule, and there are some. Uh, exceptions, you know, they have to do with uh, investigated devices and, um, you know, the national stockpile and veterinary products and that sort of thing. But you, you can work through your, you, you know, the final rule and, and look for those exceptions. But um, a broad comment is that these medical devices, if they're commercially sold in the U.S., would need to have a device identifier. So then the question becomes, are they uh, legally responsible or is the German manufacturer responsible? So uh, the question is, you know, who is actually the, the labeler as far as the FDA concern? And that party then becomes um, responsible to, to, to uh, put these labels in place. It sounds like from the question that we had, they don't touch the label at all. So the German manufacturer is identified on the, on the label. Um, it's probably their uh, identifiers, uh, companies identify and so on. So in this case, I would say the, the German company is the labeler and because they are submitting and distributing that product in the U.S., they would be responsible to, the, to comply with UDI. Sorry, Celine. Justin wants to know, is it required to apply UDI to existing inventory? Oh, that's a great question. So the Going back to the FDA's exceptions, they have put in place um, a, a, an exclusion for existing inventory that is already um, uh, uh, marked and labeled and in stock as of the compliance date. There's a three-year window in which you can take that product, leave it as it is with no UDI, and uh, ship that product over the next three years out to the uh, to to the marketplace. So yeah, the uh, the exception does apply for existing inventory. Now, if you come out with a a, uh, a newly manufactured batch and it was not fully assembled and a final product and with a label on it at the time of the compliance date, then that does require UDI. Um, but existing inventory has this nice three-year window. Good to know. Thank you. Uh, Lisa asks, is there a time frame for submitting new UDI into GoodID after the September compliance date for new products? So I have a new uh, product. It's October. I launch. What's my requirement? Immediate? Yeah. So the yeah, that's a, a good question, and it's one of those check marks that needs to be part of your release um, uh, standard operating procedure. So the FDA does want that device to be identified in, in the good ID before it's actually outside your control and released to the product, so or released to the public. So it is a, a, a prerequisite to have that device uh, reported to the FDA good ID. Uh, and then the label obviously needs to have the UDI um, before it goes, uh, again, outside your control. So what we have seen some companies do, by the way, is uh, they'll, they'll start working on a new product or have plans and realize, okay, it, it's past September, it's a class two product, and it, I'm not bring, going to bring it out till December. So they have this extra period of time to register that product with the FDA and also get the UDI on, on the product. But it cannot hit the marketplace um, without those, those two things taking place. Ryan wonders, is the UDI label date the registration date or the manufacture date? Uh, I'm sorry, what was the, that question? What was, what the date, the date of the UDI label, is it so the, the registration date, the date or the manufacturing date? 
So the options there were manufacturing date or and registration date. Or a different date if that's the right answer. What's the date of the UDI label? Yeah. Okay. So there, um, there may be a date already on this, this product. And the various dates that appear on products are many times manufacturing date. It could be an expiration date. It could be a use by date. Um, I don't believe the registration date is typically put on a label. Now, when I was talking about a published date in the Good ID data set, uh, that has only visibility to the FDA as part of that submission to the Good ID. That published date is not actually on the label itself. So, if she was thinking that registration date is is what I referred to as the one of the data fields called a published date, then uh, that's not on the label. Um, and that's the event that we talked about earlier, which is this um, date that the FDA uses to promote the product uh, in, from unpublished and initiates the grace period. So Ryan follows up. So is this a format for dates? Pardon me. So this is a format for dates, not a mandate for dates on the label beyond current FDA requirements. Oh yeah, that's a that's a great point, um, and I neglected to mention that as we walk through. So th all those production identifiers, as the FDA refers to them, such as the manufacturing date, expiration date, uh, even a serial number, a batch number, and so on. The FDA rule says that if you don't have them now on your label, you do not have to add them. So it doesn't require adding those particular elements to your to your label. But it goes on. The final rule goes on to say if you are currently in using those for production control and, and, and it's on your label, then you do have to um, flag that information and report that to the FDA. I'm going to double check for Maya. She thinks you answered her question. She has a multiple use device, a therapeutic laser. It never expires, so she's going to use the manufacturing date, okay? Got it. Good. Irina asks, what is the production ID? Do I need to have two barcodes, device ID and production ID? Uh, some companies actually uh, do break it apart based on the issuing agency. So the FDA has a little bit of background here. The FDA has recognized uh, three uh, global product identifiers uh, that will be able to create a a unique uh, device identifier. They have standards. The one that is overwhelmingly used, well over ninety percent. Um, is a company called GS1, and their protocol that's applicable here is something called the G10, the Global Trade Identification Number. And there's a similar uh, standard from from Hibic, which is is also available. But in either case, the FDA asks you to go to that issuing agency standard to see if you can break the device identifier and a production identifier apart and um, both of those those agencies allow you to do that. As an option you can concatenate and basically run them together into one very long string and have a, a long barcode or you can have uh, uh, two separate barcodes based on the particular standard that you pick. Okay, uh, next I'm going to ask some of Floyd's questions. Floyd, you don't need to use the cap lock. Um, it seems very urgent, these questions, so I'm going to go next with Floyd. Is a different DI number required for each layer of packaging? Well, I think that's the easiest one so far. Absolutely yes. Next, how often do we have to verify the labels on the containers? Each lot?
How often do we have to verify the, the labels on the containers? His follow-up question is, what is required? What is the required frequency for UDI verification of grade level quality? Oh, okay, got it. Now I understand this one a little bit better. The, um, the, the again, the issuing agencies talk about uh, the quality of the code that appears on the label, and um, in particular, the the uh, GS1 company has a reference to a, a quality code of B or better, and the actual frequency of checking that barcode in what is referred to as verifying that barcode to make sure it meets that quality is left up to the manufacturer. So you might put in your design history file uh, a discussion about, well, uh, we have done some studies or we've done some evaluation and it feels as though at the beginning of our run and at the end of the run is sufficient. Um, you also might have another sample that says, oh, well, we check it at the beginning, middle, and end. Um, you know, and then other people will, will have a, a verification process, you know, on a different sampling basis. Uh, it's technically possible for a verifier to actually appear in line and verify every individual product that flows down the line. So. That, that's a, um, a risk analysis and, and uh, an evaluation that the laborer has to conduct on their own as to the frequency of evaluating the quality of the label. And I will make mention at this point that the verifier is a totally different apparatus than a, than a reader. So you might have a barcode reader that interprets the values, but a verifier evaluates the actual uh, presentation of that information and looks for a contrast between the bars and, and, uh, and the light area and so on, and comes up with a, a grade um, depending on, on the quality. And it can change based on you know, your printing process, especially the surfaces and environmental conditions and so on. I don't know why I'm surprised, but we still have a queue longer than the next 15 minutes will allow. Um, so let's keep going and let's see if we can continue the game of Stump Gary. Deborah asks, for accessories to a medical device, does every accessory, even those not relied upon for safety and effectiveness, such as dust covers, need to have a good ID? Uh, in, in that case, the accessory question is, it falls back on the labeler. So there is a definition from the FDA regarding accessories. Uh, in, in a general comment is that accessories that are part of the device system would need to have a UDI. Um, and certainly if they're marketed separately. So that's a yes but, for dust cover? Well, but, but then the flip side of that coin is not everything is, uh, let's say that dust cover is um, not sold separately, then you know, that's a, a real easy one. You don't need to market uh, separately. Okay. Uh, let's say the dust cover is attached to a particular uh, uh, box and it's covering some connectors or something and, and or a uh, um, whatever. So it, it covers a, a connector and protects it during the, the shipment. So uh, maybe the, the other device that is being shipped actually has a UDI on it and the dust cover is considered a component of that apparatus. So in that case, uh, you know, dust cover does not need it. So uh, there's a little bit of a gray area there, Joe, and we'll need some more information to... This is uh, exhausting. <laughs> Seriously. I mean, this is like why I have an accountant do my taxes. I, I now understand why you've done so many. It's like, let Gary answer the question. Okay, Gary, next. Once right. you establish your good ID account and input the data for the product, it's my understanding Oh, pardon me. Is it my understanding the next interaction requ I'm sorry, Michelle, I'm having a hard time with this question. Let me come back to it. I'll ask Dan offline. Um, Deborah again. If the product is identified with a serial number, and that serial number can be internally matched with a manufacturing date, does the manufacturing date 
also need to appear on the device label? Uh, no, it does not. So that goes back to that original discussion that we had where the uh, label did not originally have the, um, the, the, the date on it, then, you know, there's no reason to add it. So it sounds like there's an internal mapping operation that puts the serial number and uh, allows a lookup of the serial number and, and returns the, uh, um, the date. So there's no reason to add that to the label. Finally, from my friend Ginger, thank you for waiting. For new 510K submissions, whose review period encompasses the compliance date. Are you with me so far? Yep. Do you recommend leaving a boxed area on the draft label showing where the UDI would go? Her client does not yet have established uh, full manufacturing. They are just in design and development at this point. Yes, that's a great uh, uh, plan, uh, thinking ahead. I would definitely recommend that. Uh, we do understand that at some point in time, uh, as part of your 510K application, one would need to identify something called the device identifier. So that would be uh, a part of the UDI, but it identifies you as the labeler and also identifies the product and down to the mo model and version. Um, it's certainly appropriate that you don't have any production identifiers w when you're or developing the product, so you have no idea what the serial number is and batch and, and so on. So that's all production-based. So the FDA will not be asking that for the 510K application. But reserving space, as suggested in the question, is a great idea. Lauren, thanks for being patient. She emailed in a question. Do you recommend applying UDI to replacement parts that are periodically replaced, such as hoses? Does the device's original hose then need a UDI separate from the device's UDI? Well, I figured Joe sooner or later would, would talk about spare parts and replacement parts. There you go. <laughs> and sure enough, it came up, right? Um, this isn't the first time I've asked that question in eight webinars, is it? <laughs> no, it, 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 it's a very very common question and a lot of concern obviously with to figure out the scope of how much you have to identify. Um, so replacement parts. <clears throat> so that falls under uh, the category of, of spare parts and spare parts, replacement parts, if they're going out and put into a finished device, they do not need their own UDI. Now, once again, uh, just like the tax collector has all these uh, special scenarios. If you market that replacement part or spare part as a standalone item, um, you commercially make it available and, and you market it and it can be purchased by a customer uh, as, a, uh, as a standalone item, then it does need a UDI. So if it's going out being shipped as um, a component, if you will, inside a system that's already in the field, in doing a one-to-one -one replacement, no UDI required. And the significance here is, is basically uh, a one-to-one -one replacement that does not change the model or version of what was shipped previously. So if, and here's a scenario that might uh, uh, put a little bit more clarity to this. If a spare part is shipped out and actually is an enhancement and for whatever reason significantly causes the the uh, the safety or the effectiveness or maybe there's it's significant enough to be a different model or version then the issuing of that that item and assembling of out in the field would require the whole system to have a new uh, UDI but those are special scenarios I think uh, the, the first straightforward answer here is that spare parts and replacements do not need UDI we are 80 minutes into this and we have 80% of the people who signed on still on. So many questions left. How would you apply UDI to a single medical device that is packaged in multiple containers and assembled by the consumer? Also from Lauren. So we have a single device 
uh, multiple packaging containers. The assembled by the consumer. Assembled by the consumer. Okay. So the uh, let's call this uh, you know device A, um, and it gets put into let's say a, um, a um, let's say it goes into a pouch, and then the pouch goes into a box, and then the box goes into a uh, carton, and then it's shipped out the door to the to the end user. So what I was trying to illustrate is that in all those cases, in each of those packaging levels there is only one quantity one product in each of the levels. In that case, the FDA allows you and, and actually um, requires you to have a single UDI for each of the packaging levels. So you have one device in one bag, one bag in one box, one box in one carton. The final label um, that is shipped out the door, the FDA would like to have that UDI uh, vis visible and, and apparent. Um, if it's typically uh, a normal procedure for the end user to keep that item on the shelf at, a, at, at, the, at the carton level, then you only need to have the UDI at the carton level. At the time of use, the carton is discarded the box is discarded and the pouch is discarded and you're now down to the product and the product has a UDI on it, then um, that's all you need. But if it looks like the, the maybe the carton is discarded and the product sits on the shelf as a box, so the time of use someone goes and pulls a box off the shelf, now the FDA would also like that particular container with the UDI on it. Again, it's always the same UDI when it's quantity one in one additional item. So I will mention that some of these, these scenarios uh, um, are covered in the uh, UDI um, guide that we have available. So starting up and learning about uh, device identifiers and you know working your way through this process. Um, I, again, we're kind of talking very quickly through this scenario. But there is some good written material uh, freely downloaded from a website that uh, helps you to understand these scenarios. Damien asks, with manual entry to FDA, can you cut and paste or save and modify as a new record if multiple products are the same except size? Or does all data have to be re-entered every single time? Well, there is a uh, limited feature. There is a uh, function called copy inside that particular uh, FDA web interface. So you can you can copy some fields. It requires you to change the the ones that have to be changed. So obviously you can't have two records with the same device identifier. Um, and and that does allow you to do some efficiencies. It does require you to obviously enter the the first um, master value if you will and then go back and make appropriate changes as required to those um, fields that change over the course of time. Uh, one thing I'll mention that uh, comes up is in the future if there's a change let's say there's a, a contact change to a uh, um, uh, like an email change to the contact person or you know catalog number gets slightly changed whatever um, as you make edits in the future you do have to make edits one at a time so if you have a thousand items that use the same data value that would be a thousand opens a uh, thousand edits and and resubmit as opposed to doing some electronic submissions you're able to make those thousand changes in a in a bulk fashion and spread it, distribute it across multiple records, and then basically at a push of a button, you can submit updates to the FDA. So there, there are some um, considerations in uh, initial entry as well as editing in the future. Speed round. I'm, I have one question here for you, and if you answer fast enough, we'll squeeze in one more. Is the FDA expecting GTIN for the device ID or the production ID? If a GTN is required for the production ID, does the issuing body provide for sterilization? Pardon me, serialization. 
No, in this case, um, a G10 number uh, is, is referring to the device identifier. The production identifier values uh, that relate to a serial number, a batch number, and so on, they are applied by the labeler to the, la to the actual label, product label, but the actual serial number itself is not sent to the FDA. Only the initial device identifier portion is. You will simply need to report the fact that there is a serial number on the product, and that's a Boolean, yes or no, and that's a one-time entry. So every individual serial number, batch number, uh, those actual values are not reported to the FDA. Good idea. Okay, last question. Uh, poor Lisa has 20 parts in a package, and she sells hundreds of the kits in different combinations. What does she do? Uh, well, if it's a, a kit, um, and I, I guess we don't have time to go into all that today, but the, uh, if there is a kit that this uh, individual sells, meaning that you know, there's multiple devices all assembled together, uh, one or more devices, and the FDA has a special exclusion for that where just the kit needs to be uh, identified with UDI and sent along the way. In this particular scenario, if the individual components, uh, I think you said about 20 individual components are ordered independently and just uh, out of convenience, um, you know, shipped together, she could take the tack of identifying those 20 components with individual UDIs, and then um, she would, would avoid all the you know, the thousands of permutations that, that would uh, result from assembling those individual components. So um, there's a couple different scenarios there. Either way, uh, this is something that should be reported in the design history file in case there's a question about it. So um, I am going to see Gary at his place on August 8th and 9th in Horsham, Pennsylvania. I'm uh, the Retech folks have graciously opened their headquarter doors to me, and I'm going to host uh, my next marketing and sales workshop there on August 8th and 9th. And um, if you come, you get a twofer, because I'm sure we'll get Gary to sit down in a side room and have some one-on-one -on -one time with you. You think you can handle that, Gary? That sounds great. Sounds okay. great. Okay. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, you know him, you love him, Gary Sainer. Thanks, Joe. This has been another uh, um, uh, a very effective, uh, great time of interaction, Q&A, and we were glad to help these uh, Class II labelers face their deadline. And um, time's a waste, and so let's go out and work. Perhaps the next one we do will be five hours long, so we can get to all the questions. <laughs> Right. Thank you, Gary. Thanks, everyone, for Thank attending. You. And uh, we will follow up with the video. I've already given you a link to the slides. If you haven't received it, you are welcome to email me. We'll have the video out later today, is anticipated. Thanks very much. Uh, goodbye from Seattle.